before we start our episode today, this is just a reminder, History Hack does have a Patreon account and all of your donations are gratefully appreciated. There's lots of perks on there, secret groups on Facebook. Do get involved. We would love to see more of you. Enjoy the episode today. Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. I'm very excited because we're doing badass women's act, aren't we? We are, we are. We've just done a recording that we won't talk in great depth about, but it was it was not something that we had any kind of knowledge right. of, but we're I'm relieved so... to be in the 13th century. I'm so confused. <laughs> I'm so confused. I need to sit down with the book um, and and go over it and stuff. But it relieves me that the interviewee was just as confused as we were as well. Yeah, this is true. This is true. But that's not going to be the case for this one, because we are, like I say, we're, we're 13th century. We're talking about the Magna Carta. So we're back on something that we kind of understand. And we're talking to Sharon Connolly. She's our kind of historian, to be honest. She writes, she researches, she gives tours. She does a little bit of everything, really. Lately, she's been obsessing over medieval women, and the result is her latest book, Ladies of the Magna Carta, which looks at women of influence in 13th century England, which I've always been a bit kind of irritated that we've sort of ignored this. So I'm, I'm glad that we're doing this today. Sharon, great to see you. Welcome to History Hack. How are you? Thank you. I'm fine. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Do you know one thing we do need to do? So this, and this is not, Zach, this is, uh, this is pedantry of the highest order. But Sharon, it's not the Magna Carta, is it? No, it's I'm Magna Carta. So you have, why is it Magna Carta? And that this is like, you know, when we did the thing, Zach, and you can't say the Mayans, you just, you say the Maya, not Maya. Do Mayan. we need to edit that out? Have I just been a moron? <laughs> no. The second time this let morning. Sharon, tell us why it's not the just think it's because it's it just means magna carta just means great charter it's not actually although it does refer now to this particular magna carta it just means great charter rather than the great charter <laughs> uh so yeah I, so I when i first did the book i did have it as ladies of the magna carta but then when i started reading up on it nobody else was calling it the magna carta so, and there are a few of them. There isn't just the 1215 one, there's a 1225 one. And So basically, Zach, in the real world, no one, no one's going to give you grief, but in the no. medieval <laughs> historian world, they're screaming at their devices right now. So I'm going to be hunted down by angry medievalists. Okay, yeah. that's, that's good to know. So if we um, get, we'll get um, Eleanor Yanniger to fight your corner, because no one's going <laughs> to mess with her. The only worry about being hunted by angry medievalists is they do have some great torture devices and ideas <laughs> and things. So it is a worry, because they know all the ways to kill people, but... <laughs> I'm not being funny. I'm a crime and punishment nerd. We flog people. So, well, you know, then. come at me with your torture devices, medievalists. Zach's um, all about the torture devices. <laughs> well, I'm a great one for modifying that hot poker. And I have threatened my husband with my curling tongs. <laughs> <laughs> but don't, no, definitely cut that out. <laughs> Damn, that was going to be really fun. <laughs> All right, can we, Alex has done her bit of pedantry. I want to do my bit of pedantry. So, Disney's King John. Please tell me it was Disney. I haven't screwed that up. It, it is. Disney, oh, I it? love okay. him. So we've got this lion sucking his thumb. It's embedded in Alex's brain. It's embedded yeah. in my brain. I even used it to teach and occasionally had students turning around to me going, but that can't be real because the King of England can't have been a lion advised by a snake. Thank you, Einstein, for, for those contributions. <laughs> but in terms of that kind of image of King John as the incompetent fool, how fair is that? And to what extent is Magna Carta as a result of incompetence and loss of control or other processes altogether? I don't think he was totally incompetent. He was ruthless. He was paranoid. And um, because of the way things turned out for him, he has come across as one of England's worst kings, if not the worst. Well, he did but, lose the crown jewels, didn't he? This is the thing. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> Although apparently now they're not exactly sure it was all the crown jewels. It was just his baggage um, that he lost in the wash. So they think some of the crown jewels might have been in there, but not necessarily. Um, but yeah, he and he did nearly lose England. You know, when he died, um, 
two thirds, I think, of England were under French control. And he only had three royal castles, Do Dover, Windsor and Lincoln, still in his control. So he was, I think, as the fact that he wasn't totally in control of England when he died, marks him out as an utter failure because he weren't in control. And as my son will tell you, the best thing John ever did for England was dying when he did so that William Marshall could take over as regent and recover the situation. But at the same time, it wasn't all John's fault. You know, he inherited a kingdom that, that went from Scottish border in the north to the Pyrenees in the south. This vast kingdom that had all different empire, sorry, that had all these different administrative systems in place. And if you were Henry II, who was constantly on the move and born to warfare, or Richard I, who was very similar, you were going to be able to hold on to it, but it was never going to last forever. And unfortunately with John, he wasn't the military genius his brother and father was. He was pretty good at the administration side of things but the military side of things. He, he could do it when he needed to, but not necessarily when he had to. So he lost Normandy. And he had problems with Aquitaine because he fell out with the losing ones. Um, so he, called, he, he was going to, somebody was going to lose all these lands and it just happened to be John. And I think that's been the problem for him. He's seen as a loser all along the line but some of the things were like well he, it wasn't necessarily his fault and even some of the terms in Magna Carta they were to redress wrongs that had been going on for decades and not just during John's reign you know the provisions for um to for widows who were forced to marry again even though they didn't want to and inheritance being um, take, stolen and sold off without the heir uh, knowing about it. And um, just, I mean, Richard I sold Northumberland to the Bishop of Durham. You know, they were, they were, there were things going on all the time, even before John, that people complained about. It was just, John was the last straw <laughs> and he got the brunt of everything. <laughs> So he does in 1215 and this document comes about, we're going to talk about that so uniquely your book is about the women who were affected by this document. Um, yeah. So I guess we need to start with the, is it the Browse family? I'm not sure on the pronunciation because uh, it's like some it's, ancient medieval spelling, but what happens to them and how does this relate to Clause 39? Yeah, it's either Breos or Breus. Um, Somebody actually asked on Twitter one day, is it Breos or Breus? And it was 50-50. The answer yeah. was literally, it's Breos, it's Breus, nobody can decide. It looks like some <laughs> so old French I, spelling, doesn't it? It's... Yeah, so I used Breos, but it could yeah. be Breus. But basically, um, William de Breos was a really good friend of John's. They, um, he was one of his closest allies in government and he was a very good friend. And when John murdered his rival for the throne, Arthur, in 1203, William de Breos was with him. Um, John never admitted to killing Arthur. It's always one of, those, it's one of those things, he did it, everybody knows he did it, but nobody's saying he did it. And the problem was, a few years later, John decided that William de Breos wasn't his best friend anymore and he'd loaned Breo some money. He'd actually given him a county in Ireland, but then made him pay for it. <laughs> and then by loaning him the money to pay for it. And he wanted this money back. Uh, well, that was his premise to actually go against Breo's and demand hostages for this money. And he asked for Breo's to send him two of his sons. He wasn't in, Matilda was basically, and she answered the door and she said, I'm not sending my children to that man. He can't even look after his own nephew. So he's not getting hold of my sons or something along those lines. And um, apparently William berated his wife and told and said to her, what have you done? You signed our death warrants by saying this to John. And John decided that's it, I've had enough and chased William de Breos and his entire family over to Ireland, through Ireland, 
and um, Matilda and her eldest son and family um, made it to Scotland where they were captured and sent back to John in Ireland and then sent to imprisonment in England. William de Breos was allowed to stay at large in order to raise the funds that John said he owed him. But instead of trying to raise the funds, which he knew he couldn't do anyway, he disguised himself as a beggar and took the ship to France. So leaving poor Matilda and their eldest son, William, in John's charge. John actually went, had Matilda brought to him and said, you owe me this money, your husband's gone, you pay it. And she said something like, I've got 15 pounds in gold to my name and nothing else. You're welcome to it, but that's not going to do it. And so John imprisoned her and their eldest son, William, who was about 30 at the time. I always, when I first read the story, I thought of it as her being about 30 and a seven year old boy, but no, she's about 50 at this point and her son's about 30. And they were imprisoned either in Corfe or Windsor Castle. I've never been able to work out which, nobody seems to know, it's one or the other, but we don't know which. And basically left to starve. John basically forgot to feed them. And the chronic, a chronicler wrote that on the 11th day, the mother was found dead between her son's legs, still upright, but leaning back against her son's chest as a dead woman. The son, who was also a dead, sat upright, leaning against the wall as a dead man. So desperate was the mother that she had eaten her son's cheeks. And it's just this horrible thought of this 50 year old woman trying so desperately to stay alive that she's actually eaten into her son's cheeks. All the rehabilitation you did of John at the beginning of this podcast. <laughs> Look at Zach's face. He's like, I'm not buying if you don't give a crap if he's good at administration. He's a monster. <laughs> That's the thing. It's like, that's the problem with John. There's this thing where he does do some decent things, but his treatment of Arthur and his treatment of Matilda de Breaux is just so totally horrendous. It's like, well, you know, what? you see it all the time these days, don't you, where they say somebody was good at this, but no, he was a bad husband or she beat her children. And then it's like, no, it's just like, no, he literally starved Matilda de Breaux to death. But that's where Clause 39, where the inspiration of Clause 39, because 39 is, no man shall be taken, imprisoned, outlawed, banished, or in any way destroyed, nor will we proceed against or prosecute him, except by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the laws of the land. Because she you know was what? in prison. It, it annoys me that it says no man. Yes, it's a bad woman. <laughs> Yep, same here. But basically, it allowed for trial by jury for every single person. You were not allowed to be imprisoned without see, receiving justice first in a trial, um, which is basically what happened to Matilda. So the um, her death brought that about, and that's still the basis of our justice system today. I'm not sold on King John in the slightest. I hate to break this to you. He's like a less talented Napoleon. In fact, even Napoleon wouldn't be that much of an art. Well, actually, maybe Napoleon would be that much. He would if it were his own soldiers in Egypt, but probably not. <laughs> yeah, yeah less than there and legged it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ran away. So, okay, so we've established that King John is like the Napoleon, the less talented Napoleon yeah. of the medieval period, as far as I, I don't I'm like concerned. John. <laughs> but I love studying him because I think he is, he's very colourful. You know what I mean? You can get, there's so much about him to actually study and to try and understand. And a lot of it, I think, springs from his parents. He's so, <laughs> um, far removed from us in terms of, I mean, we're talking nearly a millennia now. That yeah. I, This is Kit's thing, isn't it, on History Hack, where it's been like, it would be really funny if all these people hadn't starved to death as a result of being shut up in Windsor Castle, or possibly Windsor, possibly somewhere else. And that. Yeah. At this point, we can look at it and it's, it's quite entertaining. But, it, but as you say, what a way to die. Um, yeah. What a dick. So we have Clause 39 yeah. um, as a result of a woman. Mm. But you've managed to eke out loads of stories about women. Zach, hit us with another one. Okay, so Ella of Salisbury, who's she? What does she do? Where's she in all of this? Ella is, I like Ella. She is one of the, 
She has been described as one of the most influential women of the 13th century. Um, she is one of two women I know of um, at that time who was made a sheriff in her own right not just because her husband, her dad was sheriff or something, but she was actually created a sheriff. Her husband had been sheriff first. And then after he died, she was made sheriff, but it was a charter for her to be sheriff. Whereas sometimes women carried it on, did it as sort of a deputy to their husband. She actually did it as sheriff, but she was a young heiress. She'd been, her dad had died when she was about nine. And, um, so she was made a ward of the king and there's all these stories of her being kidnapped when she was a child and I think they got mixed up with some with Richard the Lionheart story as well because there's this story of a um, minstrel riding around France singing underneath windows to try and find nine-year-old Ella and free her and it's like yeah that sounds a bit too much like Blondell for me <laughs> But, and she was made a ward of the king, so it is very unlikely she was ever kidnapped by grasping relatives um, to keep hold of her money. She was married off within a year of her father's death to the king's brother, William Longspay, who was an illegitimate son of Henry II. Um, because she was Countess of Salisbury in her own right, Longspay needed money, lands, and a title, so it worked both ways, except Longspay was about. 20 at the time I think maybe even 30 I can't remember if offhand um and Ella was only nine so we sort of had to wait for her to grow up a bit before they could be husband and wife but they do seem to have had a good marriage and they had eight children four boys and four girls um Long Spain was very much in the heart of government with his brother Richard the first and then King John he was captured at the Battle of Bouvines in 1214 and held prisoner for a year, but then came home. In 1225, he went off to Gascony, I think it was he was supposed to be going to, and ended up shipwrecked and nobody knew what had happened to him. It was thought he was dead, but he actually managed to get rescued and was um, very poorly for a while. So he was in this monastery off the coast of France getting better. In the meantime, Hubert de Burgh, who was justicia for Henry III, um, decided to suggest um, Ella marry his nephew. And I think he was quite forceful for this because Ella used Magna Carta, um, one, of the, uh, one of the Magna Carta uh, clauses says no widow is to be distrained to marry while she wishes to live without a husband. So she used this, even though she thought William was still alive, she used this to stop Hubert de Burgh making her marry his nephew. Because she's like, well, you can't make me. I'm a widow and Magna Carta tells me that I don't have to marry him. And um, he actually, they actually got taken to court when William got back. Hubert de Burgh and his nephew were taken to court for trying to force Ella to marry. And um, they had to admit guilt and apologize and all that. But then, I mean, William died the following year. And as I say, Ella became Sheriff of Wiltshire until 1228. She was a major religious benefactor. She managed to find two, found two priories in one day, 16 miles apart. She laid the foundation stone for one and then rode all the way to the other to lay the foundation stone for that one as well. And the, I can't remember which order it was, but one of them was Laycock Priory. And that's the one she actually joined as a nun in the end when she retired. And um, she was abbess there for about 20 years. But she, she was incredibly long lived as well. She didn't die until 1261. Um, and she was succeeded by her great granddaughter as Countess of Salisbury. <laughs> so she'd outlived her husband, son, and grandson. I love um, her. She sounds yeah. brilliant. She's amazing. I really like her. Um, there's a, you've already mentioned William Marshall. Um, just quickly for people who don't understand who he is. He's a, a big cheese in, in this period, isn't he? But we want to talk about his daughters. Yeah. Yeah, Marshall was, he's 
known these days as the greatest night, thanks to Elizabeth Chadwick and Thomas Asbridge, who both named books The Greatest Night about William Marshall. Um, he was known for his loyalty and integrity. He served Henry the Young King, Henry the Second, Richard the First, King John and Henry the Third. So he served five kings <laughs> and he died when he was about in his early 70s. So he'd been, he'd just been in a life of service. And he had, he'd married, Richard the First had allowed him to marry Isabel de Clare, who was um, Countess of Pem, yeah, Countess of Pem Pembroke. She was the daughter of Richard Strigel. I think that was his name and they had land in Ireland and Wales and he was made Earl of Pembroke. They had ten children between them, five sons and five daughters and with five sons you would think that the daughters probably didn't matter but in the story of England those daughters became important because none of the five sons had legitimate sons of their own so the earldom and the titles would eventually pass to the daughters. The eldest daughter was Matilda Marshall, and she was married uh, in about 1214, I think it was, to, let me get this straight, Hugh Beagle, Beagle the, Earl of Nor the son of the Earl of Norfolk. The Beagles are ever so funny because they have Hugh Roger, Hugh Roger, Hugh Roger, and I can never remember which one's which. We've just <laughs> had all of this down. with Constantine and Theodosius, haven't we, Zach? Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> so she married Hugh. The problem was Hugh and his father were on the side of the rebels. So poor Matilda had this thing where she was on the side of the rebels because her husband and her husband's father were. And she was a, and they were holding Framlingham Castle against the king. Her father was on the side of the king. And you have this with both the eldest daughters of William Marshall. His other, his other daughter, Isabel, was married to Gilbert de Clare, who was one of the 25 barons named as the guarantors of Magna Carta. Um, Matilda's husband and father were two of the other 25 barons. So you have this horrible situation for this family where, I mean, poor William Marshall, his two of his sons, I think William and Richard, were also on the side of the rebels as well. But he stayed staunchly because of his integrity. He stayed staunchly on the side of King John, even though John distrusted him terribly and wouldn't actually allow him the privileges due to his rank and exiled him to Ireland for about eight years, I think it was. But he stayed on John's side. But, so you had this thing where Framlingham was under siege. Um, there wasn't actually a, a battle or a siege. They basically, the um, defenders sent to the Earl and said, can we give up because we're being surrounded by the King? So they surrendered the castle. In the castle was young Roger, Matilda's young son, who was about five years old, I think. Um, and so he was suddenly in the custody of King John. Luckily for Matilda, her father was on the side of King John. So you have this thing where she's, she and her husband are the rebels. The king's got hold of their son, but luckily because her father is on her, the king's side, her son's going to be safe. She's not got to worry about what happened to Matilda the Breos or Arthur because she knows that John needed William Marshall. So he's not going to do anything to hurt William's grandson. And in the end, William was the one who had custody of his grandson anyway, because when John died, he became the regent and he was in charge of everything. But and you have these, like I said, there were five daughters. Isabel was married to Gilbert de Clare and then she married Richard, um, Henry III's younger brother. And you have Eva Marshall, who was married to William de Breos, who was um, Matilda de Breos's grandson. But he was the one who ended up being hanged by Llewellyn the Great because he was found in the bedroom with Llewellyn's wife, Joan, 
King John's illegitimate daughter. <laughs> oh dear. Oh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, he was there because he was marrying his daughter, Isabella, to Llewellyn's son, David. And the marriage still went ahead. And there's these letters from Llewellyn to Eva saying, look, I know I'm, <laughs> I've hanged your husband, but it might be an idea. This marriage, I don't mean anything against you, and this marriage could still go ahead. It would be a good marriage for both of us. What do you think? So, thank you. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we're both slightly gobsmacked by that. Um, <laughs> Now, there's only... I am paraphrasing, by the way. Yeah. That is no, no, I, I... <laughs> I love there it. Probably a couple of four suits in there, and you know the odd mileage <laughs> or something. We haven't got off to the best start. Yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> Christmas is going to be a bit awkward for the next couple of years. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure we can get through it. <laughs> okay, so there's one clause only in Magna Carta that refers to is it very specifically to women or is it that it refers to very particular individuals tell us about what it is and what it's aiming to do and, and everything about it why does it come about even none of them are mentioned by name there are three women who can be identified in magna carta one is in the security clause clause 61 which is the queen basically isabella of angola the other is in clause the other two are in clause 59 and they're basically, they're the Scottish princesses. They're the sisters of Alexander II of Scotland. And they've been in English custody since 1209 and the Treaty of Norham. Part of the deal of the Treaty of Norham was that John would marry off, would take custody of the two princesses of Scotland and arrange their marriages. The idea was that he would marry them to um, his sons um henry and richard but henry was one year old at the time nearly two and, Ri and richard was only eight months at the time so the girls would have to wait for them to grow up the girls were probably born in the early 1290s so by this point they were already in their mid to late teens and having to wait for these babies to grow up wouldn't have been fun but basically john took them into custody in 1209 and still had them in custody in 1215, unmarried, their futures still undecided and he'd promised to marry them, to get them married, but he didn't want to marry them anywhere where they could form alliances for Scotland that would be unfavourable to him. So there was an alliance suggested with France that the eldest would marry um, Philip II of France, but John put paid to that because he didn't want Scotland and France allied and him sandwiched between, which is why he was like, no, I'll, go, I'll find them husbands in England. But by 1215, he still hadn't found them husbands. So they were mentioned in Magna Carta as part of this agreement. There were other hostages as well from the 1209 treaty. And it's, these people he'd kept in custody for six years and the Scots wanted them back. So Magna Carta said, yep, yeah, we will sort out what has happened with the Scottish princesses and the other hostages. And of course, John reneged on Magna Carta anyway, so nothing was actually done until 1217, Alexander came to an agreement with the regents of Henry III that they would sort out the marriages of the girls and um, the eldest Margaret ended up marrying Hubert de Burgh in 1221. Funny that the regents who said that yes they'd sought out the marriages of these girls, one of them is Hubert de Burgh and suddenly he's marrying one of the girls. So he married Margaret in 1221. And the problem was with that is Margaret was a princess and in 1221 Hubert de Burgh was just a baron. He wasn't, he didn't have title. He did become Earl of Kent, but not until 1224. So it was quite a come down for poor Margaret to be a princess expecting to marry into a foreign country and become a queen to have to marry Hubert the Bird. But it also meant that her sister Isabella was suddenly seen as the sister of a baroness rather than a prince, daughter of a king. So her marriage prospects 
became even less at the same time. And she ended up going back to Scotland without actually finding a husband. Um, but then was married to Roger Bego, the Earl of Norfolk, the young boy who'd been, in, who'd been captured by King John and looked after by his grandson, by his grandfather, William Marshall. Um, he suddenly was married to Isabella, but it was a really unhappy marriage. They didn't get on. She was about 20 years older than him, which might have explained it. And um, they didn't have any children. He did try and divorce her at one stage, but he was ordered to go back to her. And um, yeah, it was not a happy marriage. But it all more, more marks going against John at this point. <laughs> I mean, it's all so sort of incestuous and you know, it's like a posh version of an episode of EastEnders or something where everybody's kind of, you've only got so many people yeah. in, in society slash in the cast and so everybody sort of ends up canoodling, inverted commas, with, with somebody else. It's, it's, um, it's quite a sure. tight-knit society, yeah. isn't it? I was, crying. I was thinking that I should have done Family Trees in Ladies of Magna Carta, but when I started doing it, it was like, I can't do it. They're all over the place. They were all related to each other. Like Ella of Salisbury, her grandfather's sister was William Marshall's mother. Yeah, I just, I, I, would, I would have done exactly the same and abandoned that concept yeah. as well as you. It's like, and they're all related to the Warrens, the Salisbury's, the Quincy's. Everybody was related to each other. So even with the Magna Carta and the Barons' War, they were all, it was still a cousin's war. <laughs> so we're, you've just mentioned somewhere we're going next. We're going to Surrey next. So hmm. the De Warrens had a great pedigree, didn't they? Oh, they did. They were, I was thinking about them earlier. They were, their cousins were the kings of Scotland, France and England. John was a first cousin to William de Warren, the fifth Earl. Um, he, the fifth Earl, he was third cousins to the King of France and um, second cousin to the King of Scotland. So it's like they were related everywhere. They had lands in England from um, Sussex on the south coast uh, at Lewis. They had great lands in Norfolk. They were rivals to the Beagles in Norfolk. Um, at Castle Acre, and they had Cunisborough Castle and Sandal Castle in Yorkshire. So they had land everywhere. When the first Earl came over with William the Conqueror, he was the fourth richest man in the kingdom, the first richest after the royal family. So it just shows how expansive their lands were. And Isabel de Warren, who was the fourth countess, was she was married first to King Stephen's son, William of Blois, and then um, Hamelin Plantagenet, who was a half-brother of Henry II. So they've got all these family ties. And then into that, you have, this is not going to endear you to John. I was going to say, are we, is he about to come sweeping in and be a dick again? Well, he is the father of the illegitimate son of one of the daughters of Hamelin Plantagenet. Of course he is. Um, we don't know which daughter, it's either Ella or Isabel, but yeah, they appear to have had a bit of a canoodle and produced this son, Richard de Warren, or Richard of Chillum, who was himself a waste of space, <laughs> and started selling off his wife's lands and things. But yeah, so you've got this family dynamic that's like, when William turned against John in 1215, when um, Louis of France came over, William saw that John was losing, so decided he'd support Prince Louis. There, there were rumors that he did it because of John having this affair with his sister, but that had been 20 years ago, and either the bloke held a really, really long grudge or he changed his mind or there were other reasons and I think the other reasons were because they were he could see the writing on the wall John was going to lose so he needed to support his other cousin the Rhea of France but it's... you have Williams the Warrens you had this he had he ended up marrying Matilda Marshall 
the widow of Hugh Beagle, the Earl of Norfolk, and the daughter of William Marshall. So you've got all these, like you say, all these families all close together. And they had a daughter, Isabel d'Aubigny, who married the Earl of Arundel. And Isabel is one, another of my favourite 13th century women. Henry III, there was um, um, an, a man died in, in Goldisthorpe and um, his lands were claimed by Henry III in wardship for the man's son. Unfortunately, some of the lands were actually held from Isabel d'Aubigny. So, and she, rather than let Henry claim these lands that belonged to her, she went to Henry and said, oh, you've claimed all these lands, these ones are mine. And now those ones are yours. He, some of them were rightfully Henry's, but some of them were Isabel's. So she said, I want my lands back. And um, let me just get the bit where I say it. Damn straight she wants her lad back. I like her as well. Yeah, and so she stood up to Henry III and she actually invoked Magna Carta. She walked into the court and women weren't supposed to speak in court. They were supposed to be seen and not heard. And she stood there and said, where are the liberties of England so often recorded, so often granted and so often ransomed? and accused him as a shameless transgressor of the liberties laid down in Magna Carta. You go, um, girl. Yeah, exactly. Not a girl. She just... So when um, she had to write to Henry again to say um, she was awarded the lands and the money, but she wasn't, they weren't paid to her. So she wrote to Henry again and said, can I have my money? And Henry was in France at the time and he wrote to his wife, Eleanor of Provence and said, Yes, she can, so long as she says nothing appropriate to me like she did before. So basically, yes, she can, so long as she doesn't tell me off again. So it's just like this poor blue king, scared of being told off by little Isabel Dobin. <laughs> I love her. I don't care if you're a king. Give me my money. Exactly. You're not nicking my money just because you're a king and I'm a girl. <laughs> Are you perhaps related? Alex, you know, I, just, I, I was listening to that thing about how women were supposed to be seen and not heard. And just can you imagine if by some freak of time travel, all of the girls from the History Hack crew were suddenly deposited in that room and oh, yeah. keep their mouth shut? How do you think that would play out, especially after they started like Beth started drinking mead? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you'd probably all be had tried as witches or something, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> women had these women in knowledge? those days. Yeah. We yeah. had to yeah. know how to fight and we had to know how to use our strengths. But I love but that I... you found all of these women who nonetheless had agency and yeah. just demanded it for themselves. Should we do another one? Let's talk about Isabella of Gloucester. What, oh, what's, yeah. what's the story there? Does oh, she just go and Isabella. slap the king in the face or something? It's, are we just kind of building? Poor Isabella. She was married. She was the granddaughter of Robert of Gloucester, who was the half-brother of Empress Matilda. And when Henry II was alive, he was handing out all his lands to his sons, but didn't have anything for John. So he decided the best way to deal with John to give him some land was to marry him to Isabella of Gloucester because she was a great heiress. She had two sisters. And in those days, if land, if land was inherited by a son, it stayed together. If it was inherited by sisters, by girls, then it was split equally between them. But Henry III organized it so that Isabella got all the land and her two sisters were disinherited. So that all this land could then go to John. And so John married Isabella. Problem was the Archbishop of Canterbury turned around and said, yes, but you're cousins, so you can't, if you're married, that's fine, but you can't go to bed. <laughs> Basically, you can't have sex. He told them that they were, weren't allowed to. So poor John and Isabella were in this marriage where they weren't actually allowed to be physically intimate with each other um, because the Archbishop of Canterbury had told them so. But for John, there were all these lands and he wanted the land. So they stayed married until John became 
I think Richard the first wanted John to stay married to Isabella because then he couldn't be a threat by going off and marrying a French princess or something like that. So it suited Richard that he stayed married to Isabella. Problem was then when John came to the throne, he needed to get rid of Isabella because he wasn't allowed to sleep with her, which meant he couldn't get an heir. And um, he, they probably, they had spent some time together, but most of his illegitimate children had been born either during his time with Isabella or before. So it was like, it wasn't a happy marriage. So he got rid of Isabella as soon as he could. Um, within about a month or so of becoming king, he divorced Isabella. But he didn't want to give up her lands. So he divorced Isabella, but he kept her. Oh, <laughs> like a pet, basically. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, he sent her to Winchester and he held her for, I think it was um, 14 or 15 years in all. What? I hate this man, I really do. Looking after her lands. Um, and then when he married Isabel d'Angelem, who was about 10, between 10 and 12 at the time, some, some people suggest she was only about 10 years old. Um, she was certainly no older than 12. She was actually given into Isabella of Gloucester's custody. So <laughs> Isabella was basically a surrogate mother to her former husband's new wife oh so we're going to move on to Isabel of Angoulême now yeah. uh, who is basically the 13th century equivalent of Katie Hopkins why <laughs> is she so unpopular oh god I had a really hard time writing about Isabel because um at first I felt so sorry for her you know she was this 10 year old child married to a man 20 years her senior who's a git who's a git Mm -hmm. and um, sent to live with his ex-wife. <laughs> they didn't have children. She and John didn't have children until 12 or 7. So I think he did leave her alone to grow up. But the chroniclers at the time, who didn't like John, actually accused him of staying in bed with her till midday and abandoning the governing of the kingdom to spend time with his wife. Um, I don't think that actually happened the way they say it does. She was supposed to be beautiful, but she was still only 10 years old at the time. And like I say, they didn't, their first son wasn't born until 12 or 7. For, so for those seven years, it suggests that John did actually leave her alive. Is this the, the French prin the princess in, um, oh, what's the film? Robin Hood, who's peering through the keyhole. Um, as yeah, he... I must say. Yeah, oh, is that who we're talking about? Is that, yeah, is that so. fair? I mean, is she... Is yeah, she, she was is... supposed to be very fair, very beautiful. She was called Isabella the Fair at times. Um, I think the problem with Isabel is you have all the chroniclers piling on, on John and dragging Isabel into it. And when you actually look at Isabel during John's reign, she didn't have her own money. She wasn't given dower lands like most queens are assigned. So she didn't have control of her own finances, of where she wanted, could be. She was basically a virtual prisoner of John. But the problem was when John died, she then went back to her own lands in Angoulême and her daughter, Joan, had been betrothed at the age of four to Hugh de Lusignan X, who was the son of the man she'd been originally betrothed to, Hugh de Lusignan the Ninth. So she's got her daughter, Joan, engaged to Hugh de Losing on the 10th. And she marries Hugh, leaving her daughter. Basically, she nicks her daughter's future husband and then writes an apology letter to Henry III saying, oh, I've done this because he needed a wife who could give him children straight away and Joan's only 10. So we need to do this because we need to protect your lands from the King of France. And that's why I'm doing this. And then she's eventually she even sides with the King of France anyway. So it's like, well, you didn't. She plays off Henry III against Philip II um, for her own advantage all the time. She's looking at her own advantage first. She's abandoned five children in England 
and then has another six or seven, I can't remember exactly how many, with Hugh de Lusignan, um, who, some of whom she sends to England to um, take advantage of her their half-brother being King of England and gain land and, and position there. Did she, she... Go on, Zach, you go. Did she learn to be this much of a git from John? You know, did, did he give her lessons and kind of whisper in her ear, or, or was it just did it just come naturally? They seem like they were just ideal for one another. That's what I mean, though. I felt really sorry for her in her life with John, but then when she leaves John, she goes and does all these horrendous things, like winning the award for worst mother in history. <laughs> I just I think as well it's like people have been so ruthless with her that she just it's what she knows right yeah well the thing is I mean when John died she wasn't offered any role in the government of her son her children had all been taken from her you know she wasn't raising any of her children she'd only just had one Eleanor de Mont Eleanor of England who would marry Simon de Montfort she was either a baby or not even born yet when John died. There was, no, they think she might have been a posthumous child that she was born after John's death in 1216. So she'd only just had this baby and not been given, and the baby had been taken off her and put into the household of the Bishop of Winchester. So she had no role in England. And all she could see was going back to France. But then when she gets there, she nicks her daughter's husband. It's like... Wow. Not all of these women end up sort of benefiting from Magna Carta, do they? So Eleanor of Brittany, Clause 39 doesn't end up helping her, no. does it? What's her story? Eleanor was the sister of Arthur of Brittany. She had arguably a better claim to the throne than King John and Henry III. She was the daughter of Geoffrey who was um, the brother between Richard the Lionheart and King John. So he was John's older brother, which meant he had greater title to the throne. But he died before Henry II. So when John came to the throne, the argument was, do you have the son of the old king or the grandson of, the old, of, a young, of an older son of the old king? And everybody chose John because he was older at the time and more mature, big mistake. <laughs> um, and Arthur was only 12 at the time that Richard I died. But then Arthur decided he, with the help of Philip II of France, who always liked to get involved in these things, Arthur decided he could um, claim the throne. And he, he decided he'd do this by um, riding into Aquitaine, and attacking his grandmother, Eleanor of Aquitaine, at Mirabeau and besieging the castle there. And John made this, showed the only piece of military brilliance I think he ever did by riding night and day to rescue his mother. And as a result, he captured Arthur, imprisoned Arthur and eventually murdered him. At the same time, he captured Eleanor, who was Arthur's older sister. And he sent her back to England to imprisonment, knowing that he could never release her because whoever married her had a greater claim to the throne than John or Henry III. So where the clause 39 is that no one will be imprisoned without trial, with her it was like either it's her or my crown, so she's staying in prison. She was treated as a member of the family most of the time. She was um, sent gifts from other family members and things. Henry III would send her deer once in a while and vats of wine and things. And she was in Winchester with Isabella of Angoulême and Isabella of Gloucester at times as well. And she spent time with the two Scottish princesses, um, but she was a prisoner for the rest of her life for about 39 years. Just, it's bonkers. I think yeah. we should end on another Eleanor. Countess of Pembroke <laughs> and Leicester. Again, she's really significant in your story, isn't she? Ellen is, she's the next generation. Yeah. She's the one who, it's, 
Magna Carta was the wasn't the start the finish of something. It was the start yeah. of um, regulating our legal and government system. Because when you look at the following generations, um, Magna Carta was um, taken further by Simon de Montfort, who's um, instigated the first representative parliament in England in 1265 and tried to control, regulate. I'm, I'm not a fan of Simon de Montfort, but I do try and look at him fairly. <laughs> But he basically, he was out for himself as well, very much like the Magna Carta barons were. He, um, he went against Henry because he owed money and he yeah. wanted um, Henry to support him and to help him. And Henry wasn't being as supportive or as helpful as he could be. So, um, but he had married Henry's sister, Eleanor de Montfort. Well, she would become Eleanor de Montfort when she married him. She was the widow of... William Marshall. And when she was 16, she'd been persuaded to take this vow that she would remain chaste. I mean, right. a 16-year-old girl who's just been widowed. Yeah. Um, you, you've just got this feeling, you know how dramatic 16-year-old girls are. Yeah. Like, I'm never going to love again. So she says this in front of the Archbishop of Canterbury. And then Simon comes along and he's quite handsome and quite um, athletic and quite fit. And she's like, actually. <laughs> And apparently it seems highly likely that she and Simon had already decided how compatible they were before they got married. Yeah. And they went to Henry III and asked for his permission to marry, basically by the sound of it saying that Eleanor was already pregnant. So Henry had no choice but to get them married as quickly as possible. <laughs> and then Simon had to get a dispensation from the Pope because Eleanor had made this vow where she would not marry. So he went off to Rome and while he was there, he borrowed some money, naming Henry III as his guarantor without asking Henry if he'd guarantee this money. And when Henry found this out, he was furious. And Simon and Eleanor only escaped England with their lives sort of thing and went to France, leaving their son behind because they had to get out so quickly. <laughs> Oh my God, that, that's quite a swift departure if you have to leave the kid behind. Yeah, exactly. He's just going to slow us down, get rid of him. <laughs> He's fine, nobody's going to hurt him, just leave him there. So they had to send for him later. But basically, Helen, Eleanor and Simon, were there were always appeared to be a partnership. You know, it wasn't just Simon taking the lead. When he rebelled and started the Second Barons' War, he managed to capture Henry III and his son, Edward, at the Battle of Lewis in 1264, mm. and Richard of Cornwall, Henry III's brother. And Richard and Edward were put in the custody of, their, of Eleanor, rather than Simon, at Kenilworth Castle. And she, she was basically their guardian or custodian or whatever, you know, their jailer. Yeah. For, until 1265, when Edward escaped. But she was very much supporting of Simon, and when Simon was killed at the Battle of Evesham, Eleanor was um, in command of Dover Castle, defending it for Simon. And somebody had to actually go and tell Eleanor that Simon was dead and she wouldn't relinquish the castle even then. She's there um, holding this for, si for Simon. And she actually negotiated with um, Edward's, with Ed Henry III's son Edward to um, go into exile in France and to protect her garrison. She was the one who was dealt with the negotiations to make sure that everybody got out there safely after Simon was killed. She's brilliant. I just thank you so much for coming on to tell us more about, it's such a unique window that you've used. You've used, the, you've used Magna Carta to tell the story of these women of influence. Yeah. 13th century England and it's brilliant because it's like you say everything is usually done from the point of view of the men um, and and we've actually managed to get the other side and there's some positive stories but some sad ones as well um, and I I just I don't care if he had his good points I don't like him 
awful. Is that? But it's great to study, though. That's the yeah, problem. yeah, definitely. Like, you know, it's fascinating to look at him and to see what he did and why he did these things. And you just yeah. like, it's, um, but it's a great period in history. It is, you know, so much going on. I loved it. And it was all Matilda de Brayos was what started it. I did her, I did an article on her. And I'm like, but she influenced Magna Carta. And I was there, how many other women were related to Magna Carta or influenced Magna Carta? And my other great heroine is um, Nicola de la Haye, who held Lincoln Castle for King John. She was like, and that's my thing. Why does she support John when nobody else does except William Marshall? And it's like, I think John, John supported her when she lost her lands in the reign of Richard I. Mm. So she stayed loyal to John after that because he'd supported her. But there's this woman who in her 60s is holding Lincoln Castle against the French and the rebels and then rescued by William Marshall. It's like, there's no movie about it. I mean, <laughs> I know. This is like every time we do a, an episode, I'm like, this could be a Netflix series. Mm. Oh, yeah, definitely. A series on King John's reign. That would be brilliant, actually. Yeah, <laughs> I did I did love the portrayal of King John in that Russell Crowe Robin Hood film. Mm. The only thing I remember is how just delightfully whiny and irritating <laughs> King John was in that film. Everything Typical baby son, baby brother. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us. We will make sure that your book is available on our bookshop so everyone can get hold Thank of it. Thank you. You're welcome. I hope I made sense. <laughs> when our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them, and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack, or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support, and here's to your next great book.